Hello, everybody. This is Marjorie Morrison, co-founder and CEO of PsychHub. And oh, do we have a treat for you today. I am so excited to introduce to you Dr. Drew Ramsey. Dr. Ramsey is a psychiatrist, an author, and a farmer. And his work is focused on clinical excellence and nutritional intervention. How cool is that? He splits his time between New York City and Indiana, where he lives with his wife and children on their organic farm. You may have heard of him through his TED Talks or his bestseller books like Fifty Shades of Kale. I love that. We are so grateful to have Dr. Ramsey here with us today because new science connects food with mood. And oftentimes, treatment can overlook this critical factor about what people eat. So I'm excited to introduce you to him and let's hear the answers to the most commonly asked question that Dr. Ramsey hears from his patients. Dr. Ramsey, thank you so much for being here. So tell us, what is nutritional psychiatry? Marjorie, thank you. It's really great to be here with you all and it's really exciting with the collaboration between Psych Hub and Columbia Psychiatry. Nutritional psychiatry is the application of food and nutritional science to brain health. So when we think about mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, yeah, things like schizophrenia, PTSD, we, we have robust treatments for all of those. What do we do in terms of advising patients on, on what to eat? And then when we think about patients who or people who are, you know, where I think a lot of Americans are, right, that you've maybe got some symptoms or maybe there's some mental health concerns in your family and you're looking for things that you can do to improve your mental wellness. Nutrition is like one of the most important levers that we have in terms of overall lifestyle health that we know so many Americans are making the wrong choices and and are eating foods that are really bad for health and we focus a lot on like obesity and diabetes and the ways that you know our current food choices inform those health conditions but there's this all this new nutritional psychiatry science which really looks at how food and food choice and dietary patterns influence our risk of illnesses like anxiety and depression and then really cool science about how Maybe in helping patients with their diet, we can improve their outcomes clinically with uh, mental health concerns. It's almost kind of earth shattering because you're right. I mean, we all talk about these things independently, but not really together. So you've learned a lot. It sounds like you're, you're smart and you read data and you get educated and you're also doing it hands-on with an organic farm. Is there true evidence that shows that food choices impact our mental health? Yeah, for sure that there are. You know, part of the thing about nutritional psychiatry is really thinking that all the data right now that's really strong is about augmenting treatment. It's kind of what we do in, in my clinic, the Brain Food Clinic. It's, it's also really in, in my new book, Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety, kind of how I try and talk about it, that when you think about beating depression and anxiety, there are lots and lots of things when you see someone do that that they bring to the table. You know, even if people have a response to medications or even if really psychotherapy helps them, when really people kind of get into full remission from an illness, they're often, they're often marshalling a lot of different aspects of their life. You know, their sleep hygiene is improving. Their relationships usually are improving. Um, and, and nutrition is kind of one really important aspect of that. And so the data has come out. It's been really interesting. It started out with correlational data showing that populations that eat a, a dietary pattern that's more Mediterranean uh, style, or another way to put that is just a traditional, it's called a traditional dietary pattern. So if it's a Japanese diet or a Norwegian diet, just diets that are made of more whole, unprocessed foods, folks tend to get less depression and less anxiety. Um, particularly then what's been interesting is this increase in the randomized clinical trials where individuals with clinical conditions like depression, are being given some form of dietary counseling and to augment their treatment. There have been a number now, uh, I guess four trials doing this, um, uh, and, and they've been positive. And it's been really interesting because, you know, one, it's established, because these are some of the first trials ever that have been done, and it establishes that one, in a mental health setting, you can talk to patients about food and really change their behavior. And then two, it establishes like it's not. 
it's not like crazy wild changes. It's, you know, eating more fish, eating more legumes, eating fewer processed foods and sugars. It's not like some crazy wild mix of, you know, saffron plus nutmeg plus turmeric, you know, shaken, not stirred. It's, it's, it's stuff that in some ways, you know, as you said earlier, it's surprising. But also what's surprising is that it's a lot of it is, I wouldn't say just common sense. There's a few tips and tricks. But a lot of it is around common sense eating of getting back to, you know, the foods that, that we grow on farms and we fish out of the ocean um, and, and to move away from the foods that are really, you know, kind of obviously now contributed to the burden of chronic illness, both mental health-wise and physical health-wise in America. It's really interesting to think about it, how the two are tied together. I know I chose a few year, years ago to switch to a pescatarian diet. Oh, so yeah. That's, am... that's, like one, that's one of my favorites. How's that one treating you? <laughs> it's been phenomenal. Um no, I think it's been a few years now. I, and I'm very like, um, and let's share everybody listening. Pescatarian, at least as I understand it, Marjorie, you tell me if this is what you're doing. Usually that's a variation of vegetarian diet. So very plant forward, um, or plant focused, usually some eggs and dairy, but no meat and, or chicken, but fish. Correct. And, and Marjorie, I would, and you're going to, you're going to hear the nutritional psychiatrist in me. Good, go, and and go. I hope I'm about some bivalves, which is the, really the, you know, some of the, um, actually, one piece of research that I, I just want to share a little bit, we did a, 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 with a, a colleague in Toronto, Laura Lachance, we looked at creating a nutritional profiling system. A lot of people have seen these. There's a way of kind of, kind of summing up the data around foods. People have seen them if you shop like in Whole Foods, there's an Andy number sometimes, which is the aggregate nutrient density index. Um, kale, by the way, is a thousand on that scale, right? So it kind of ranks foods on a sc- numerical scale. So we created the antidepressant food scale. And Dr. LeChance and I looked at what are the nutrients most related to clinical depression. And we found in the scientific literature that there were really 12 that stood out. And then just asked a really kind of simple question, like what foods have the most of those 12 nutrients per calorie? Not that these are the only foods you should eat. There are lots of foods, you know, that are my favorite brain foods that aren't on this list. But it was just an interesting way to kind of, it's actually the first nutrient profiling system that had looked at brain health. And, uh, and to think about what are the, the foods that are on there. And so bivalves, mussels, clams, and oysters are actually three of the top five animal foods um, on the list. It's just why I mentioned those. And also they're just a really, you know, they're one of those foods that you, you don't think you're going to go to the doctor and get like a recommendation for like clams or mussels or, you know, wild salmon or anchovies. But if we think about what you get with those foods, you get incredible brain nutrients, omega-3 fats, the one we talked about a little earlier, highly correlated with mental health. Not so clear supplements help, but pretty clear that seafood consumption helps. Uh, you get lots of uh, vitamin B12, a complete protein, selenium, iodine. Uh, it, it's just, you know, uh, phenomenally healthy uh, food. Vitamin D, uh, really one of the only food sources of vitamin D is in fatty fish and seafood. So. I love it. It's so great. I know you'll be disappointed in me. Last night I did have mussels, but I had mussels frites. And <laughs> Why would I not? This is, a, this, this is a good question. This is the other thing in traditional psychiatry is important. <laughs> is to liberate the French fry and more specifically to liberate the potato. And, and the reason that is if a lot of people think I'm judging them. And as I said earlier, I'm a Columbia psychiatrist. We're really not in the judgment business. We're really here to help people. So I don't know why you feel guilty about French fries, especially when you're eating them with such a nutritional powerhouse. The, the potato itself, not, now the French fry is probably not the best form to eat it in, but the potato itself is a wonderful, wonderful source of potassium, a little bit of iodine in there, vitamin C. There's a lot of nutrients in a potato. So, I love it. See, I knew we were going to love Dr. Ramsey. It's funny. I use my kind of mode is if it just comes from the earth, right? So to me, I always buy, I live above a Whole Foods, but I always buy a bag of potatoes and sweet potatoes. And I cook potatoes all the time. And I always say, I know they say potatoes aren't good for you, but how bad can they be? They right from the ground. So I appreciate you saying that. So like, what are there? I mean, you talked about this list. So it's kind of like you gave us a teaser of food. I give you a little teaser. <laughs> Are we not going to get the full list? Are there? I'm happy um, to give you the food list, and I'm going to, and I'm happy to tell you more important. I mean, we can go over specific foods because I think that helps us when we're in the grocery store, and that's really my my hope in our talk today um, is that people listening will will think about you know this holiday season about their brain health. We'll think about when they're in the grocery store about their brain health, and not in a like let's deprive you from everything good way, which I think is often how nutrition is described. But let's really fuel your brain to new heights. 
Let's armor it up. Let's make it resilient. Let's give it all the nutrients it needs. And because it includes things like one of the, in my uh, new book, I've got this list of um, power players, these foods that I just, I just think they should be in your kitchen all the time. Like, no, there shouldn't be any controversy. And one of them is dark chocolate. It's a really amazing brain food. Um, and, and so there are foods and then more importantly, food categories is what I really kind of learned in this work, that I was big into the kale, as you mentioned, 50 Shades of Kale, but what I learned in the last book, Eat Complete, was really to think of, let's broadly think about these food categories. Let's think about seafood. What are seafoods that people should really be considering and eating and trying to weave into their dietary pattern every week? It's not fish sticks, it's not like a breaded fish sandwich, right? What, what, what sh it should be things like anchovies, really inexpensive, easy to get, easy to cook, or things like sardines, right? Again, simple fish. Um, leafy greens, right? Not just about kale as much as I love the kale, but uh, really what we call nutrient-dense food category. Leafy greens are basically waters, vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, just incredible, incredible anti-inflammatory food. So I think another part of the evidence in nutritional psychiatry is all this new evidence about the microbiome, all these bacteria that live in the gut that kind of regulate inflammation and regulate a lot about mental health and regulate a lot about energy and how we metabolize and store energy. And then, and then about this new buzzword in medicine and mental health, right? inflammation, that, that we're now increasingly thinking about depression and anxiety as being involved in kind of chronic inflammatory states. And so again, food just becomes this really interesting way to intervene. You know, not that it's the only thing we should do in mental health, but like, gosh, if I could like get you to eat a little more wild salmon and eat some, you know, enjoy your, your muscles, uh, frites, you know, but also, uh, you know, have lots of plants and rain, what we call rainbow vegetables in your diet, maybe add in more fermented foods. These, these food categories that really I try and work with people to kind of interwoven into their treatment, emphasize and get them to be thinking about and being creative about as they take care of themselves and nourish their brain. Well, this is uh, so fascinating. Are there any foods that like we should stop eating? Like, I mean, you mentioned process, anything that just stay away. Yeah. I mean, so let's, you know, there's kind of some categories that I think about where I see a lot of people having challenges. Um, some relate to palate and, and kind of palate development that a lot of people are really hooked on a kind of sweetness, whether it's diet sodas uh, or regular sodas or sweet drinks of just uh, almost kind of a hummingbird syndrome of just kind of constantly slipping, sipping on a sugary drink. Um, I remember I interviewed a doctor once I was giving a talk at a hospital out in California and, uh, I got a volunteer. I do kind of show our food, um, kind of assessment and what a nutritional psychiatry assessment does. And she was ha drinking, uh, three to four lattes a day. And when you think about it, it's just really kind of sipping on a, a sugar water, you know, a little bit of protein in there. And, and so there are a lot of ways that people, uh, intake, you know, when we call it, say, processed foods, what that sort of intake, simple carbohydrates and, and sugars. Um, and so I think really looking at that and taking that from this, like, these are evil processed foods, thinking, like, what does that mean in your life? Because it's not like I never eat those. Like, I don't know, I had a ham and cheese omelet this morning. I don't think people think that sounds like the most amazing brain food. But I have a clear accounting in my head of the amount of, you know, kind of processed meats that I'm eating. It's pretty low. Uh, the... Um, uh, I, I have a pretty clear accounting through the day of like the amount of vegetables and what plants I'm eating and where seafood fits in. And, and so I think those are all important things we really just encourage people to, to keep track of. In terms of big, big no-nos, um, I, I think the ones that I, I see the most of in, in people are, uh, uh, you know, things where there's this mix of, you know, like kind of burgers, those typical American foods, burgers, pizzas, um, you know, when we say processed foods, a lot of it is baked goods, um, doughs, breads. So I wouldn't say those are absolute no-nos. The way we work in nutritional psychiatry is like, how do you upgrade that to brain health? It's not like I don't eat, ever eat pizza. It's just, especially during the pandemic, there's no pizzeria around I'm on my farm. You know, we make it. And there's lots of veggies on it. There's some anchovies and fish on, on some. We make a clam pizza that's really nice. So, you know, I think there's that question of same thing with bread. It's not like I say get rid of bread and gluten is horrible for everyone. It's just that you try and really upgrade that, uh, you know, carbohydrate with a lot of nutrient density. So that that's kind of 
I wonder too, as I'm listening to you, when it comes to mental health, is there also a relationship with food when you're taking the time to prepare it and then sitting down and eating it compared to opening it up out of a package or getting fast food? hundred percent. It, it, I want to answer that question. I also want to say there are some things that I guess if I want to be a little harsher, I think people shouldn't eat or drink or consume vegetable uh, sort of vegetable oils other than olive oil, maybe avocado oil, coconut oil. There's a lot of seed oils people are consuming. There's a lot of controversy about this data, but I avoid those. No Good to know. Trans fats, if you look hydrogenated, if it says hydrogenated on the back of the package, don't buy that. Doubles your risk of depression, high consumption of trans fats in, in some of the data. Um, I avoid things with food dyes. I avoid things with processed meats. Um, uh, and, and I generally recommend that people, you know, the goal is more plants. And if you can try and make some of those plants, organic plants, particularly the plants that are on the environmental working groups, what's called the uh, dirty dozen, which is a list of foods, even some of my favorites like kale, where, you know, spend that extra 50 cents or a buck and, and get the organic version just because it's the leaf you're eating it. it, it those are the, the dirty dozen are kind of the, the vegetables and produce that tend to have the most pesticide residues on them. So that's a good, that's a good takeaway for our listeners, because I think a lot of times we don't always know what should we buy organic or what shouldn't we, but it sounds like if it's, you're consuming the vegetable and it's raw, that that's a good time to spend a little bit more on organic. I think the general first, you know, check out the environmental working group has a great list that gets updated. But the way I think about it is if I'm eating the skin, so if like it's a blueberry, if it's, um, you know, a leafy green, uh, if it's an apple and the skin is really some of the healthiest stuff in a plant. So I try to consume the skin. I, I, I go for an organic version. If I'm peeling it, you know, I, I still tend to go for an organic version, especially if it's not that much more, more expensive, like an organic banana um, or an organic avocado, especially if you're buying seasonally. Um, but th- those are the ways that I, I try, you know, but, but again, I, I think it's also, if you're in a jam, uh, don't buy expensive organic produce, buy produce, enjoy it. Don't worry about it. Eat more of it. That's, that's, you know, there are a lot of folks who, um, you know, they hear brain food and they hear this kind of stuff and they think it's all about, you know, really expensive food. And it's not, I think one of the most important things about our work is to try and really empower people that eating well for your brain health is something that you can do. It's something that we can all do a little better, better job. It's affordable. It's good for you. And then you made such a great point, Marjorie, that it's more than just all these nutrients. Like, yes, I want to load up your brain with omega-3 fats and B12 and B6 and vitamin E and all the phytonutrients. Like, I think brains that have more of that are healthier and do better. But the other part that's really gotten lost for a lot of people is the culture of self-nourishment and the, the culture and personal culture around kind of food uh, preparation, food sharing. I, we, I work with so many patients, especially a lot of men who, you know, they just, they never were taught or thought about how to cook. It's not part of their kind of emotional lexicon almost. And so getting people to just feel a little more confidence in that arena to take care of themselves and then to share that. Cause it's, you know, it's such a, like our best, a lot of our best moments are over a meal that we cook. Right. I mean, that, that's such a, I don't know, especially now such a wonderful time for us, or it can be. I can't thank you enough because I I've learned a lot and um, people need to think about this and you've helped us think about it in a different light. How, how can our listens, listeners follow you and learn more? Well, thank you, Marjorie, so much. It's really fun to speak with you, and I really wish you success, and I hope we'll be able to come back on and and maybe share some more as the evidence matures. There's so much to talk about in this field, from inflammation in the microbiome uh, to fermented foods to really interesting studies going on uh, about things like fasting and ketogenic diets and brain health. But um, And so Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety comes out in a couple of months. Um, and so I, I appreciate everybody um, checking that out for a pre-order. Um, Eat Complete was my most recent book, and that goes over 21 different nutrients. And really, in a kind of simple way of like, all right, you know, selenium is important for brain health. Like, what does it do in your brain and what foods have the most of it per calorie? And then all of the recipes um, in the book are made by, from these most nutrient-dense foods. Um, people can come to my website, DrewRamseyMD.com, or I'm pretty active on Instagram. I'm at DrewRamseyMD. 
And uh, mostly everybody, you know, thanks for listening to this whole podcast about food and mental health. And I mostly want you to really do what we ask people to do in clinic is just think about something that's been bugging you, maybe a food category you really haven't thought about or you haven't worked on, like like seafood or leafy greens or beans and, you know, legumes, lentils, maybe, maybe red beans. But think about some way that, you know, or something in your diet that you want to swap out, you want to upgrade. You know, maybe you're eating a croissant every morning. I've been in that rut. What, what could you, you know, could you get a bagel and locks? You're getting some seafood there. Or, or could you upgrade that for a smoothie, like a blueberry, almond, you know, uh, uh, a dark chocolate smoothie? So I just ask you to set a couple goals. Think about a couple of food, nothing too big. And just really work on feeding your brain for the next couple of weeks, especially as, as winter is here and um, as we're all dealing with a lot in this pandemic. And um, and I just wanted to, to thank everybody for uh for all of your attention and all you're doing to take care of your mental health. And Marjorie, thank you so much. It's really such a treat to talk with you and your enthusiasm. I'm so happy you're already a pescatarian. There's very little work to be done here from a nutritional standpoint. So I'm glad that you were able to to take a couple of tips and feel empowered to seek out the bivalves. And I really look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Oh, this is great. Thank you so much. As always, thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed the show, drop us a review. If you haven't already, subscribe to our podcast for the latest episodes. For the latest insights, check us out at psychhub.com.